This insignia belongs to men serving the United States Marine Corps in the SATS program, short airfield for tactical support. These men can build an airfield for Marine Corps jet fighters in just three days anywhere in the world. To do this, the Marine Corps utilizes an air transportable 2,000 foot aluminum map runway, complete with aircraft catapults, arresting gear, landing aids, and ground support equipment. You're about to see the initial installation of one of the vital systems of the SATS airfield, the trackless catapult. With it, it's possible to launch 50,000 pound aircraft to 180 knots within 1,700 feet. Without it, a SATS airfield would be considerably longer, sharply reducing its mobility and utilization. This catapult, designated the CE-2, was developed by the Naval Air Engineering Center and All-American Engineering Company. In November 1963, the first CE-2 was delivered to the U.S. Marine Corps Air Station at Quantico for installation and evaluation. In order to better follow and understand the operation and installation of the catapult, this illustration shows the general arrangement and principal components. As you see, the catapult consists of a power plant, towing cable system, and a shuttle arrest and return system. The power plant uses a single jet engine, which exhausts into a free power turbine, in turn directly coupled to a reduction gearbox and friction pulley known as a capstan. In simplest terms, the power plant drives a wire rope or cable in a continuous loop arranged around runway shifts. The cable drive is actuated by the capstan pulley, upon which three or four loops of the cable are wrapped. To keep the necessary spring action in the system and maintain friction on the capstan, a device called a cable compensator is used. The shuttle and shuttle arrestor system involves the attaching by means of a bridle of the aircraft to the cable drive for launching and the detaching, stopping, and returning of the shuttle to the battery position for the next launch. The shuttle itself is hooked onto the cable by wedge-shaped clamps. At the end of the launching, the aircraft lifts off and the shuttle is caught by an arrestor consisting of nylon ropes which act like rubber bands. The arrestor knocks the clamps loose, stops the shuttle by stretching the nylon ropes, and then propels the shuttle back to battery, much like a slingshot. At battery, an identical nylon arrestor brings the shuttle to a complete stop, in position and ready for the next launching. Now let's see the pictorial record of the Quantico trackless catapult installation. For this operation, standard Marine Corps ground equipment and personnel were utilized. After the power plant site has been graded, the engine base is positioned. Once the base is in place, anchoring pads are connected to it and light but strong aluminum stakes are placed in position. As you can see, they're easily handled. The stakes are driven into the ground through holes in the anchor pads by air hammers. These stakes take the shear or horizontal ground loads developed during launching. Next, adjustable mountings for the power plant are brought up and attached to the top of the base. The overturning loads are offset by explosive anchors. These are placed in anchoring lugs on the engine base and driven into the ground. A small powder charge is lowered inside the anchor. A cap is placed over the anchor and then the powder charge is exploded below the surface. Quick drying cement is poured into the cavity and the anchor is set. The gearbox is installed next since it's placed on locating keys which set the fixed position for alignment of the remaining power system components. With the gearbox installed, the jet engine, in this installation a J79-8, is placed in its mountings. The CE2 is a single engine system, but it can be installed as a dual engine system. An inlet duct, known as a bell mouth, is then placed on the front of the engine. Now the power turbine, which is the actual direct power plant of the catapult, is placed on its adjustable mountings. 
and fitted to the exhaust of the jet engine. On the exit side of the power turbine can be seen a flange of one of the two flexible couplings on the shaft between the turbine and the gearbox. Next, the large inlet duct is installed. This duct prevents foreign article ingestion into the engine, as well as providing a human safety measure. The alignment of the power turbine shaft with the gearbox shaft is done by means of a surveyor's scope sight placed in the quill shaft of the gearbox. By sighting through it to a small mirror attached to the center of the turbine shaft, the power plant can be optically aligned in the field. Following the initial alignment of turbine and engine, the exhaust ducting with the turbine to gearbox connecting shaft in its center is put into position. The purpose of the exhaust duct is to divert the hot exhaust gases vertically and aft to the power plant. This eliminates hot air re-ingestion, which can cause flame out of the jet engine. Notice too the flexible coupling between the exhaust duct and the gearbox. Then the installation of the capstan or friction pulley mounted on the output shaft of the gearbox. On the opposite side of the capstan shaft, a friction brake with cooling lines and ducts is installed. The brake holds the cable when placing the aircraft on the catapult and stops the cable after a launch. Flexible cooling ducts connected to engine compressor bleeds provide a steady flow of air through the brake. With the placement of the friction brake, the power plant installation is complete. Now the cable compensator is put in place next to the power plant base and connected to it by ball lock pins. The first section of the compensator contains the fixed and movable shivs, while the second section contains the actuating system, the high pressure cylinder and piston, and four air oil accumulators. The piston rod connects to the movable shivs, closest to the actuating section. This section is set in place and secured with the explosive anchors. Following this is the hydraulic control system for the compensator, an independent, self-contained, electrically powered system. In the background can be seen the control system for the catapult operation, a small box-like hut near the power plant. While the final stages of the power plant installation is going on, the runway shiv assemblies are being set in place. Again, aluminum stakes and explosive anchors are used. Since the shiv mountings can be contacted by taxiing aircraft, all shiv assemblies are fared into the matted runway, forestalling possible damage to wheels or landing gear of aircraft. There are four turn shiv assemblies, two at each end of the runway. A fared strip is placed between the two shivs at each end, covering the tow cable as it goes on and off the runway. While this is going on, the nylon rope anchors for the arresting system are installed. To do this, Sections of matting are cut out and the base plates are set in position. The arrestor rope turn shiv assemblies and anchors are mounted on top of the matting. Again, since the turn shiv and anchor assemblies are on the runway itself, fairings are set in place over the turn shiv assemblies. For this, long spikes are used, set in the same manner as the aluminum stakes. Then the lightweight cable return trough is assembled and set in place alongside the runway. Once all the turn shivs are in place, the cable is pulled into position on its dolly. The cable itself is in a continuous loop and mounted on twin reels. The hookup begins at the far end of the runway from the power plant. After the cable is placed manually into the two far turn shivs, the shiv covers and guides are put in place. Then the dolly is towed to the opposite end of the catapult. The cable is unwound, placed in turn shivs there, 
and then turn toward the power plant. Finally, the cable is fitted into the compensator's fixed and movable shift. and looped over the capstan. With the cable fully in place and all the guides and covers installed, the cable is now tightened by the compensator's hydraulic system. This completes the power plant and cable installation. The next component of the catapult system is the shuttle arrestor. The nylon arrestor ropes which cross over the tow cable are threaded from one anchor through and around the turn shivs and back to the other anchor. Although only one rope is necessary, two are used for reliability. Tension is taken by a vehicle pulling on each rope through the anchor assembly on one side of the runway. Once slack is taken up by the vehicle, clamps are fastened to hold the rope at the desired level of tension. To prevent wearing of the nylon by the cable and to make sure the shuttle will hit the arresters, a metal cylinder called a fair lead is installed over the tow cable and with a loop on top of it for the arrestor ropes. This ensures a fixed relationship between the cable and ropes under all conditions, as will be seen in the aircraft launching sequences in a moment. And now the final component, the launching shuttle, is ready for the tow cable. The cable clamp, a two-sided wedge-shaped device, grips the cable with increasing tightness as tension is increased. It's put on the cable upside down for ease of installation and then rotated right side up. Next, the wheel ramp section on which the nose wheel of the aircraft rests during launching. It's connected to the final section of the shuttle, the bridle retention ramp, with pin joints, allowing up and down rotation between the two sections. The bridle retention ramp is used to stop the bridle and control its position to ensure no damage to the aircraft during liftoff. At the end of the launch, the bridles drop from the aircraft and are pulled close to and held on the retention ramp. Now you've seen how the trackless catapult works and how it's put together. Let's see it in action. Everything is ready. The field is cleared and the aircraft is guided onto the ramp of the shuttle. The nose wheel rolls over the bridle retention ramp and into the well. Notice the bridles hooked to the nose wheel strut of this particular aircraft. When all is in readiness, the launching officer signals the catapult control operator to pre-tension the cable and the pilot of the aircraft to rev up his engine. When both systems are ready, the launching officer gives the go signal Catapult power is applied and the aircraft is launched. When it reaches flying speed, the catapult power is automatically cut. The tension in the cable releases and the aircraft rotates and lifts off. Let's see it again. Notice how the shuttle is stopped by the arresting ropes and then propel back to battery. Yes, you've just seen a graphic illustration of the CE-2 trackless aircraft launcher, helping the men of SATs help provide a highly flexible and mobile capability for the United States Marine Corps.